him last summer. E. Gordon B. was settling in as President Emeritus of Ohio State, a position he still holds. Then in January, he accepted appointment as President of West Virginia University, bringing his career as Senior Administrator full circle back to where he started. Dr. E., a native of Utah, where he earned an honors degree in history, at the University of Utah, then moved across the country to attend Columbia University, where he did a joint JD, EDD degree in law and education, specializing in legal and administrative problems in institutions of higher learning. And we know they do have legal and administrative problems in institutions of higher learning. He served as a law clerk in the federal judiciary and as a judicial fellow and senior staff assistant for the United States Supreme Court under Chief Justice Warren Burger. And then in 1975, he began his career in higher education. First as faculty and assistant dean at the J. Reuben Clark Law School at Brigham Young University. And in 1979, was named dean and professor of the, of the College of Law at West Virginia University. And only two years later, he was appointed president of WVU at the age of 37, the first of seven presidencies at five different institutions. And the rest, as they say, is history. Named by Time Magazine in 2009 as one of the top university presidents in the nation, Dr. Gee served as a, uh, has spoken of being a university president, president as akin to being a pinata. <laughs> By which I'm guessing he means someone is always swinging at you. <laughs> Along the way, he's had to change his favorite color several times. And of course, his signature bow ties. And just just in case you want to know this, by the way, he's been wearing bow ties since he was a teenager, and his collection has now grown to over a thousand. Those of us on headquarters staff share a connection with Dr. D, for although he has not been president of LSU, his daughter Rebecca and his twin granddaughters live in Louisiana, as we do. Phi Kappa Phi is delighted to have one of its great minds as our keynote speaker today, Please join me in welcoming Dr. E. Gordon D. Thank you very much, Mary. That's exactly the way that I wrote that, by the way. <laughs> very well done, indeed. So uh, it's a delight for me to be here in St. Louis. And um, I accepted this invitation about 18 months ago or so. And, uh, I had no intent on being here. Uh, uh, I had no intent on being at West Virginia University. I had every intent on being here. <laughs> here I am. I, I, I tell everyone I was an accidental president the first time around at West Virginia. I was in the law school, and uh, and um, I ended up uh, I ended up uh, the, the president of the university, Gene Beauty, left to become the chancellor of the University of Kansas, and so I. Uh, uh, the chairman of the search committee was a prominent lawyer in West Virginia and decided that they wanted to have a lawyer as president, and I was the only one available. So they, they invited me. I literally found out overnight, and, uh, and then uh, uh, so that was my first accidental presidency. And then, uh, and then uh, Jim, Clem uh, Jim uh, Clements left for Clemson. I'll get that right. And uh, and uh, um, I I had uh, I had just uh, retired from Ohio State and accepted a teaching position at Harvard, and actually. I just bought myself a wonderful condominium. If anyone wants to buy a lovely condominium in Boston, I have one for you. And, uh, and uh, they asked me to return uh, to initially to help find the new president, which is what I did. Um, and I was there for about three or three months, and I found the new president, me. So uh, I am privileged to be there. I'm privileged to be with all of you. I'm privileged to be part of uh, this occasion. I, I really am. Um, I, I, and Mary, thank you very much. She and I crossed paths in. Uh, in Columbus when I was at Ohio State, and uh, obviously she is a West Virginian, um, uh, also by the fact that she was at Marshall University and the Honors College, and, and now in Louisiana, right next door to where my daughter is, so I look, uh, I, I'm grateful to have her here. And thank you all for uh, the fact that you would all gather and do such great work for our education, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit today. But you know, I get asked this question all the time, having been a university president for 35 years. Uh, 
who's counting. Uh, I get asked this question all the time, you know, what, 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 what's it like being in Virtue Fresno? So I'll tell you a couple quick stories if you don't mind. Um, I, I arrived on January uh, 6th uh, on, the, uh, on the campus at, uh, at uh, West Virginia University. And ha having been gone for about 30 years, uh, I, I decided I'd just walk across the campus. Literally, I was there about three hours walking across the campus. It was a little rainy, a little snowy, and I saw these two young ladies walking toward me. Uh, and they obviously were freshmen. They were just chatty Cathy's. They were having just the best time. And uh, all of a sudden, one of them looked at me, and she recognized me. I thought, how wonderful. I've been here three hours, and she knew me. And so I decided what I'd do is I'd be really cool. I wouldn't say anything to them. So I nodded to them, and they nodded to me. And I walked on. I, I was feeling very, very good about all of this until I heard one of them whisper the other one. She said, Kathy, she said, wasn't that horrible red <laughs> I'm rushing to the O'Hare Airport, and uh, and this woman grabs hold of me, touched my seat, she says, "I'd love to have your autograph." I thought, "Well, this is great." So I, so I, I, I pulled out my pen and wrote my name, E. Gordon Gee. She said, "Gordon Gee." She said, "Who in hell sake are you?" I thought you were Lou Holtz. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you have to go with those kind of things. But what, I, what I thought I'd do is, is also one of my favorite things is I collect notes from students. So this one, this one is a great one. Now, I, when I came to West Virginia, I started talking about the fact that we were going to move to the university from excellence to eminence. So, you know, all university presidents come up with kitschy sayings, and I'm probably the king of that. But anyway, uh, anyway, uh, and so I was around uh, preaching the excellence to eminence. Uh, uh, mantra and uh, and I got this note uh, uh, from Brad. I won't say where Brad is from. Dear President Gee, I'm a senior in high school and I'm trying to decide between Penn State and West Virginia University for College. Now I know. When I heard you speak recently, I was very impressed with your message about moving West Virginia University from excellence to impotence. <laughs> Uh, dear President Gee, I'm planning a spring break trip with my best friends from the University of Cincinnati, and we have enlisted, and this is a West Virginia kid, by the way, and we have enlisted six female cheerleaders to join us for the whole week in sunny Miami. But when we went to book flights, you can imagine my disappointment to find out that our colleges have conflicting spring break schedules. I'm right to ask if you could push West Virginia University's spring break back a week. <laughs> You're the only one with the power to help make a 19-year-old man's dream come true of that. In a remote beach house 1,200 miles away. <laughs> this is the line I love. He says, Of course, if you help out, you are more than welcome to join us. <laughs> I had a wonderful time. <laughs> so, uh, and then another, and then another thing I love to do is I, is I like to go, one, one of the pleasures is I, I like to go and read in the public schools and to, to, you know, second and third graders and so forth. And so I did this recently and I received a couple of notes. Um, um, obviously, the teachers say both to the kids. Well, you got to send him a note somewhere, brother. And so, so I've got a couple of these notes. Dear President D, this is from Maria at North Elementary. Dear President D, thank you for reading to us. It is always a pleasure to have someone read to you besides the Bean Librarian. <laughs> <laughs> we all enjoy the book. You did a great job drawing pictures and speaking loudly, which I thought was just great. And then, then this one is from Jamie Shent's class at Suncrest Elementary, Mr. Gordon. Thank you for coming to visit. It was fun because you're almost the same size as us. <laughs> It was fun to meet you. Thank you. Me and my friend Betsy want to know if you buy all of your ties from McDonald's or just the red ones. <laughs> but this is my all-time favorite. I mean, I've received a lot of notes over here, but this one, this one I think really takes the cake. I just have to, uh, I, I can hardly, I, I laugh so hard every time I read it that I can hardly get through it. It says, Dear Mr. Gee, <laughs> thanks for giving us your time. I thought it was exciting and fun. I learned that looks could be deceiving. <laughs> I'm really grateful and very thankful for, for all of the invitation. Gypsy Denzine is uh, a member of our senior team at the university, and I'm glad to see Gypsy here and uh, so heavily engaged in a, in a marvelous organization. Now, 
So I want you to know that it is a privilege to be here today. You are the country's oldest. I, I discovered that. Am I not right? And most selective, all disciplined um, honor society. Uh, as you know, changers of the world walk among us in, as five half of five members, Jimmy Carter, John Grisham, Hillary Clinton, just to name a few. By Capify, this great organization helps steer this nation and the world, of course, to grander destinations, a great college, a great responsibility, and a remarkable opportunity. Your mission and values stand firmly in line with what we do at public land-grant research universities, just like the institution that I'm now serving. We are here collectively as one to foster the future of higher education, and that is really what the focus of this conference is about, and I, and I was glad to hear in that conversation about how one is spreading their wings to really become much more integrated in the notion of the of the questioning and the opportunistic side of uh, higher education itself. Um, and so um, I'm particularly grateful that I could be here to talk about some of these issues. Now, by the way, if I get through in time, I, I know that you have to be out of here a certain time. I hopefully we will be able to take a couple of questions here. So as you know, I've been in higher education a fairly long period of time, and I call it the thinking business. Um, and I like that notion. We're in the idea business, we're in the thinking business. Uh, and as you just heard, I've been president of half the universities in this country. <laughs> and I can say without a doubt that higher education today is more important than it has ever been, I believe, in the history of this country. And certainly more important to the American public, and certainly more important to the American democratic system. Um, traditional industries are dying. Um, Superpowers like China and India are outperforming and innovating at a rapid rate. The Chinese are now building a university almost every day, if you can think about that. Meanwhile, our leaders and elected officials in Washington simply are in constant gridlock. Uh, they can't even agree, as we just discovered this week, to disagree. Uh, they fail to move our country forward. They fail to move our country forward. So now, I would say that all of us in this room and all of us at our 4,500 colleges and universities in this country we now bear the responsibility to move this nation forward. That is our calling, that is our opportunity. So all of us are partners in this thinking business. We, uh, we must strive to think our way out of the ashes of mediocrity and of non-performance. One of my favorite quotes is from General Eric Shinseki, who was the Army Chief of Staff. And I have his quote, as Gypsy will tell you, and as Robin, who is with me, will tell you. I have it on a big poster, and I post it uh, in my conference room. Uh, I open all the deans, and everyone come in, they kind of look at it, and, and uh, they wonder a about, about what I'm saying. But the quote is this, if you do not like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. <laughs> Let me just say that again. If you do not like change, if you don't embrace it, you're going to like irrelevance even less. I tell everyone at my own institution uh, that we are a bit like a uh, dinosaur. Actually, we're like an elephant at the moment, and uh, and, and that is we're big and ponderous, and and, and we have uh, we have uh, a whole set of issues that we deal with. But we're slow. We're not agile. We're not responsive. And in order for higher education to survive, whether you're public or private, or whether you're and this is for all of our institutions here, we in higher education have to move from being elephants to ballerinas, and not not uh, elephants with a tutu, but ballerinas. <laughs> or else we will become dinosaurs. We cannot afford to not change, and so we have to think about that. Uh, and America must change. And of course, higher education must initiate that change. Institutions of higher learning must serve as factories of thought. They have replaced the factories of yesteryear, the smokestack, the warehouses, the assembly line. Think about it this way. Um, when at, at the turn of the past century, 1900, the richest man in the world uh, was probably uh, Carnegie or, or Vanderbilt uh, or Rockefeller. And they are living off of smokestacks and off of extracted industries, off of steel and, uh, and uh, moving great things around on railroads. That was, that was the American dream and that was the American future. I can still remember my own father said to me, hey, listen, son, go off and uh, College, have a great time, join a fraternity, and come home and get a real job. <laughs> I have to, I have to laugh at him. Uh, later on, he'd say, "Well, son, when you're coming home and getting a real job," and I say, "Well, Dad, I'm the president of the university," and he'd say, "Well, uh, we're going to get a real job." So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, um, but now we fast forward to the year 2014. The richest man in the world is a guy by the name of Bill Gates. A college dropout. None of us 
think that that's cool. Um, <laughs> but you take a look, I was just on the Microsoft camp, campus and uh, I had a chance to actually to visit with him and, uh, and the thing that, that I came away with, which was a very, very strong impression, was the fact that everything that Microsoft is about was invented in universities. The hardware, the software, the ideas, all the development. Now, he took it and made it practical, which is, of course, the nature of the great land grant universities, which is to take ideas and make them uh, relevant to the people that they serve. But nonetheless, that is important um, for us to understand. So we, in higher education now, are the economic and social and cultural engine that drives this nation. We no longer are sidebars. We simply are... Um, we simply are central to the future. There are, there are 300 and there are 315 million Americans. There's 1.2 billion Chinese, or 1.2 billion Indians, and 1.3 billion Chinese. And we're not in competition, but we are. But just on the measurement of size and mass, we lose unless we outthink. And so now, in the thinking business, we are in that competitive stance. And so we have to understand uh, the power. <coughs> of higher education to this nation in so many different ways. So I'm going to make, uh, uh, but uh, I'm going to make several points here, and I'm going to try to do it really fast. A, a recent Fast Company article dissected the future of higher education, calling it a constantly moving target. And I can tell you that very much the case, having served through nearly four decades as a university president. Um, so I'll make several points here. My first point is one way to move with the target and ascend to the next level is by busting down the silence. I talk about uh, West Virginia University as being a, a collection of colleges and departments connected only by a heating plant. <laughs> or maybe by a PRT, we have this wonderful uh, transportation system. In other words, what we are is we are a siloed institution, and most institutions are siloed. We have grown up with the Germanic tradition, and we have grown up uh, believing that our roots are in Bologna. They are. But, but ladies and gentlemen, these siloed institutions are no longer going to be the institutions that serve as well. If the physicists and the, and the physicians and the philosophers don't talk with each other and work and manage and move across the academic spectrum of, uh, of these institutions, we are, not, we are not going to survive. We're going to become further and further isolated and isolated in the tyranny of our, of our thinking rather than the, the, the opportunity of thinking with each other. We have to move in that direction. And by the way, this is one of the wonderful things about Pike <coughs> is it is it broke down those barriers almost immediately. Uh, uh, in, in the late 1800s, they actually thought about that. So, so that is that is what is that is what I think is incredibly important is for us to move from the non siloed As I say, we are vertical universities and colleges. We need to become very horizontal very quickly, and we need to understand that when we do that, that we will serve ourselves, our students, and uh, and the intellectual life uh, much better. Um, uh, and we need to, and, and, and with all of that, we need to learn that uh, we need to learn that, uh, that that we are no longer at a senior prom. Uh, we need to dance with everybody. This issue of partnerships are very important. So as we become move from being a a vertical to a horizontal university, we have to learn that we also have to now get outside of the bounds. You know, universities. If you were to ask me, uh, what are the major challenges of universities of like? mind that I'm part of right now, I would say that there are two things. One is the fact that we're complacent. There are two words. Complacency is the first word. We're good, we know we're good, and we don't want to change. In fact, the one thing that I hear that is most discouraging in my institution, out of the 550 things that I love about it, well, Mr. President, you can't do that. And I say, why? Well, that's not the way we did things at West Virginia University, or at Ohio State, or at a variety of other places. It's as if God himself were ordained that this is the way it's going to be always. Complacency. The second thing, which is just absolutely incredibly interesting to me, what did I say earlier? We're places of ideas, we're places of thinking. We want to write the great American novel, we want to discover the cure for cancer, we want to win Nobel Prizes. But yet, so we're places of curiosity, but yet we have no curiosity about how we make ourselves better. Do not challenge the way that we are organized. Do not challenge the way that we think about how we, uh, how we work uh, amongst ourselves. Do not challenge uh, the issues of, uh, of academic uh, life as it is. In, in fact, uh, one of the things that I think about is we think about our younger faculty members particularly is the fact that I think we have a, I'm sorry to say this, I'm 70 years old, we have a tyranny of the gerontocracy. Those above 50 want it to be the way it was. Those below 40 need to have it in a different way. And so we really do have to rethink 
the whole nature of, of, of the way that we reward and recognize our faculty. Um, another rising issue in higher education, of course, is technology, the MOOCs. Uh, when, they, when they burst onto the scene about, uh, about two and a half, three years ago, we all thought we were going to become, um, we were going to move from the brick to the click university very quickly. Now, I, of course, one of the great things about having so much experience is the fact that I, uh, I had that same uh, thing happen in the early 1990s when the internet came into play. When I was at Ohio State my first time around, I never talked about the internet because it didn't exist, and then it came into uh, and it came into play, and everybody thought, "Oh my gosh, you know what? The internet uh, universities are going to disappear." Well, um, um, people invested heavily in in the online educational programs, and of course, they did not disappear. In fact, in fact, the online educational programs disappeared. But then, what happens is we move forward to uh, to, to to 2010, 2011, then when the major universities in this country, Harvard, Stanford. Um, Penn State, a right of other institutions started these moves, then they had much more credibility. And so everyone says, well, now we're going to disappear again. Um, the answer is that that's not the case. They burst on, now they flattened out. Uh, uh, Sebastian Thrun, uh, the great uh, thinking uh, uh, engineering professor from, um, from um, Stanford who started Udacity and tried the grand experiment at San Jose State. And, uh, and the answer is he, he wrote a call and said, you know, my ideas just don't work doesn't mean to say that technology is not important. In fact, it's incredibly important. But now what we have the opportunity to do is once the, uh, once the burst has occurred, is now we have to think about technology as our friend. We have to do two things. Well, we have to control it. We have to, we have to uh, maintain the quality of our brand. We have to make certain that it's a hybrid model. Think about this in an institution, uh, Ohio State, 65,000 students. Just, they're just kind of teeming all over. If you can take uh, some great faculty member from Princeton and have him give a great lecture on, uh, on, uh, on uh, economics, and then we can break into smaller groups at large. And same way with small institutions, you don't have access to, uh, to a lot of uh, folks. Uh, you know, I was, I was President Brown, which is the smallest of the Ivy League institutions. Uh, great place, but uh, very limited in terms of the amount of exposure you can get. Uh, I always joked about it, but there at, the, at, at, uh, at West Virginia University, uh, I get a chance to go to a lot of the parties and enjoy it very much. At Brown, I had to throw parties for the students. It was a different kind of I enjoy the I enjoy the former, but better than the latter. But so that so 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 that's the issue for us. That's point that's point two. Um, point three is that we have to invest in technology. Though we can't say, well, uh, the MOOC issues are ones that we're going to control. We have to invest in technology. The, the availability of what we have, I, I have an iPhone, I can't wait until the iPhone 6 comes out because I just love all this technology. I just put a Sonos system in the university residence, all these kind of things. But technology is our friend, but we have to invest in it. And universities, in order to be competitive, have to be uh, on the front end of it rather than on the back end. And that notion of technology investment is the third point we need to make. Um, we, have to, we have to engage with our students. I would just talking to your colleagues when we were coming in, you know. And I love the fact that, uh, that, that, that your president-elect who died had been to every graduation uh, since he'd been at the University of Pacific, since 1973. Think about that. Think about what that statement is. I love the statements of the academy. We talk about teaching loads and research opportunities. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Just think about that. Oh, it's such a burden to teach. And I can't wait to do my research. Well, let me tell you something. Research universities are supposed to do research. We're supposed to create ideas, but we're supposed to pass them off. We don't do it in a uh, we don't do it in a bubble. We don't create research and then just let it lay on the table. It's about passage. It's about idea creation. It's about it's about making certain our students are, are nurtured and well taken care of. So we have to we have to we have to focus on uh, on students and student life and the student uh, student expectation. I think about it this way in West Virginia. I've got, uh, the university residence is right next to a, a lot of freshman uh, residence halls. We're going to be on campus together. I know it's a little frightening to those kids, but we're going to be on campus together for 168 hours a week. And we're going to teach them for 18 hours a week. So the question is this, what do you do for the other 150? Well, the answer, the, the answer very often is this. We, we'll get a C if we, if we give them good food, we give them a good place to stay, and they're safe. That's a C. The A, the Phi Kappa Phi A, is if they are totally engaged in the life of the mind. If the, the late night pizza parties are meaningful, if the opportunities to have, uh, 
have relationships with each other in that crucible. Uh, we have students from 110 countries and 100 different languages spoken. It would be a tragedy if kids from one uh, place in the world just spoke with each other and didn't take a full advantage of the cultural and social and intellectual opportunity. So we have to make certain that we, uh, that we put, put those students first. Um, lastly, and isn't that a wonderful word, lastly? Uh, I'm pretty well. Uh, finally, you know, I had a guy the other day, he, he said finally, finally about four or five times I kept getting up and trying to leave. But, uh, <laughs> we need to seek new funding models. Higher education. Look at it this way. There's a $17 trillion budget deficit at the federal level. There's $1.3 trillion in student overhang in terms of debt. Um, and, that, and that, of course, is a tragedy for students and for higher education. That is worse than the housing bubble. But, but if our students cannot pay off their debt, we're going to have another significant downturn in the economy. It's just that simple. And then the states have no money. And the small, private, tuition-driven institutions have not crossed that threshold where they are charged more than, than students will pay. And so, therefore, they're losing numbers. Uh, a number of our colleague institutions have said, well, we're going to lower our tuition. They're not doing it out of generosity. They're doing it out of financial necessity. So we have, to, we have to think of new financial models. First of all, we can no longer just simply have the triad. Raise tuition, raise a little bit more, uh, uh, raise a few more uh, fees, and raise a little bit more money. That is just not going to work anymore. And so we have to think differently about the financial modeling of, the, of, of, of what we're doing. I, I, I hate to talk about old Siwash, but I'll talk about uh, Ohio State in this instance. So, so I could see that coming. Ohio State's budget was $6 billion. West Virginia's budget is $3 billion, big institutions. Uh, but uh, at Ohio State, only about 8% of the budget came from the state of Ohio. So I always joked about the fact that we were a state-located institution, and I'd like to move to Florida. But anyway, uh, anyway uh, and, and West Virginia's is about 10 or, 10 or 11%. That means that about 90% of the funds you're generating yourself, you have to generate it through this kind of traditional model. So at, at, at Ohio State, I said, you know, what, what is the purpose of the university? Well, it's about teaching and learning. It's about faculty, staff, and students in 11 million Ohio's. It's about teaching and learning. It's about faculty, staff, and students in 1.6 million West Virginia. So, so therefore, let's ask the question, why do we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, why are we in the parking business? Why do we own tracts of land in eastern Ohio or in eastern West Virginia? Uh, why, do we, uh, why do we have golf courses and, uh, and Air Force right away? In other words, why do we have all these encumbrances which are not central to the mission of the institution? We need to return to our mission. Then we need to say, with those other things, someone else can do it better, not selling, privatizing it. So we, we sold 36,000 parking spaces, privatized them, got a half billion dollars, tricked some uh, Australians into giving us that, and uh, <laughs> then went into the markets and got another half billion dollars. So within three months, created a billion dollars in cash, which we turned into faculty salaries, which we turned into student support and a variety of other things. We have to think different if we're going to survive as, as, as institutions. And the final thing I'll just say to you is the fact that we need to celebrate who we are. We need to understand the importance of what we're about. We, we spend too much time complaining and not enough time celebrating. We spend too much time thinking about, uh, about issues that are negative rather than thinking about the kinds of consequences of opportunities. I, I think about the great land grant institutions. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, th think about uh, maybe the most optimistic man I've ever read about. 1862, the, the, uh, uh, there have just been these incredible battles which the North has lost at Antietam. Now, uh, I know we have folks from all over the country here, so I'll just say that I don't call it the, the, the War of Northern Aggression or anything like that. But anyway, uh, anyway um, the Antietam, Shiloh, the Second Battle of Bull Run, the largest loss of American life ever. And he should have left Washington. And instead, a young guy by the name of uh, Justin Morrell comes to him and says, who, by the way, was a farmer. From, uh, from Vermont says, listen, Mr. President, it's not, uh, now I wasn't there, some people think I was, but, uh, <laughs> he said, well, Mr. President, he said, he said, it's not simply about race, it's about opportunity. It's about the American dream. And so what he did uh, is they proposed this thing called uh, the Morrell Land Grant Act. I think the single most important act ever passed by Congress, it opened the American dream to everyone. Because up to that point, the University of Virginia, University of North Carolina, William of America, those were public institutions that were just simply elite. Unless you had money and power, you couldn't go. And then all of a sudden, we became 
a, a, a nation of meritocracy. And that has been the gift of higher education. Um, we live in a world that's very tumultuous. We live in a world that's very challenging. There are very few things that are uncertain, but this I do know. I do know that higher education in this country is an exceptional institution that has allowed us to do things that no other place on the face of this earth can or will be able to do if we continue to sustain it and support it. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be here with all of you today, and thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Two questions. Do we have a question from the audience? Yes, in the back. What did you mean when you said that being a university president is like being a student president? Uh, what did I mean when I said that like being a university president is like being a student president? Because it is. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not the right answer. Uh, the, 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 the answer is a simple one, and that is the fact that um, in today's hyper, hyper uh, critical world, um, at, at West Virginia, I have 33,000 students. I have 20,000 faculty and staff. I have 1.8 million West Virginians, all of whom, who know how to run the university better than I do and tell me about it all the time. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason is, is the fact that everyone gets pieces of information. Now, with Twitter, with Facebook, with Instagram, with all the other kinds of things, and, and by the way, you can then be very critical. Uh, uh, you know, in the, middle of, in, the, in the middle of the night, someone can send me a note and, uh, and call me a doofus, and, uh, and, and they mean it. But in the morning, when they look at it, they're afraid that I'll remember their name. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, so the point is this, is the fact that uh, you're caught, and, and, and I would say this much more so, at, at Brown and Vanderbilt, um, these are great private institutions, I felt much more protected from some of the kind of vicissitudes. But in any given day, uh, in a public institution, the newspapers are writing other things, and they want to get pieces of the pie. The other thing is that it's a very hypercritical world. So you are a bit like a big guy. Questions? Yes. Over here, yes. So I go to school in New Hampshire at Plymouth State University, and uh, where, where Plymouth you State University okay. in New Hampshire. And New Hampshire, like a number of other states around the country, has been cutting the funding to our universities. We were cut by $52 million in one year for our four, for our four universities. Are you seeing a pattern like I've been seeing where there's, I would say, a lack of, lack of support from state governments for their universities because they're seeing it as an added expense and not the benefit that we all see from going to college? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, if one takes a look at all the patterns, we, and of course, the, the Grand Recession really uh, really exacerbated it. I, 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 think, I think the issue, and this is the reason that I think that what we're doing right here is so important, is the fact that we need to turn from uh, whining and complaining to being advocates for what we're doing. The other thing is that we need to rethink the nature of what we're about. Because what, it, well, what grabs the headlines? Tuition is too high, the middle class is squeezed, and faculty don't teach. That's what grabs headlines. We need to tell our story better. We need to tell it in, in, in a much better way. But we also need to address some of those issues. Tuition is too high, probably, in some places. I, 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 when I was president of the University of Colorado, I used to joke about the fact I built a pretty good university on the backs of wealthy parents from Chicago because I just raised tuition all the time. And when I was the president of Brown, I didn't care. Uh, I, I, I waited until Harvard said his tuition. I did ours $100 less. <laughs> no, that, that's not the way to think about things. We, we, we've got to be much more attuned to the fact that we belong to, we, we belong to the people of this country, we belong to the people of our state. Uh, on the other hand, we have to make, we're in, a, we're in this competitive world. Roads and sewers and Medicaid and Medicare and, uh, and public education tend to be, we, we tend to be everyone's second love. Uh, we're always the bridesmaid and not, not the bride in that sense. And so we, we tend to be everyone's second glove. And because of that, everyone says, I love the university. By the way, I, uh, I need to support my local school. Or I love the university, but I need to support my local road. So, so we really do get in a very, a very difficult contract. We need to tell our story differently, but we also need to come up with a different and, uh, and, more, uh, and more inspiring academic model, too. One last question, and I'll let you all Right in the middle. There you go. Hi. Sort of opening a huge can of worms, can you talk just briefly about the competitive competition between academics and athletics at universities? Oh, well, I, I know nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I want to be. I want to be on the. Uh, I, I want to be on the. Uh, on the record that I love Notre Dame. I love the SEC. I love <laughs> You know, it, I think I think we're at a I think we're at a moment in time. And you know, yesterday, of course, the uh, big uh, the, the big five uh, conferences uh, have started to separate themselves. Uh, Mark Gimbert, who was the who was the chancellor at, uh, at LSU, you know, um, was my assistant in Colorado for five years. I know he struggled with all of this. And talking about being a pinata, now there's the number one pinata mm -hmm. in the country. Because everyone, you know, there's not a chemistry section, there's not an English section, there's not a, uh, there's not a, a physics section in the newspaper, there's a sports section, and everyone knows about that. So, so, so the answer is the fact that I think we're at this, and this, uh, we're at this point. In 1989, I chaired the first President's Commission, the Reform Commission for the NCAA. I was president of the University of Colorado at the time, and our, and, and, and our effort was to get hold of, uh, get hold of college athletes, turn it back into control of the presidents. And uh, and to try to make certain that we that, that we uh, that we really did uh, uh, give great uh, deference to the term student athlete and we and, and all those kinds of uh, issues that, that are prominent still. The answer is this: is the fact that uh, presidents were taught in the same in the same vice as everyone else. You you go. I would go to the southeastern conference meetings when I was at Vanderbilt, and we'd all go to Destin, Florida. We'd stack hands and say, "We're going to go out there. We're going to we're going to build our academic integrity, right? Other things." And as soon as we got home, the the, the lead trustee would call, and uh, all of our good deeds would fade away. And so there needs to be there needs to be a set of common practices among presidents in which we all kind of protect each other. Number one, number two, is the fact that it has gotten uh, it's gotten increasingly. Uh, out of hand and out of bounds. But the problem is this, if you're the president of Clemson, Jim, Jim Clemson, if you're the president of Clemson um, and your faculty say to you, hey listen, we're under rate, real constraints, you can't put any money into football or basketball, so, and, and yet uh, all the fans want to, want to come. I have yet, by the way, uh, found anyone who wants to, to I, I have yet to get 110,000 people to show up to a chemistry lecture, it's just not that possible. <laughs> so, so, so if you're not going, if you're not going to put money into it as one of the sustaining forces, then you've got to grow it commercially. So those are the kinds of issues. So we, we're at we're at a real turning point, and uh, I, uh, but but I am very old school. I I think this if, if we if we turn athletics into simply um, a uh, a farm club for the pros, and I just want to get out of the business. And probably if I tried to do that, I'd be pumping gas in rural Utah, which is my hometown. So thank you very much. <laughs> Society and Phi Kappa Phi, I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you for those uh, interesting, challenging, thought-provoking, informative uh, words. Uh, you did give us a lot to think about, and I want to present to you, on behalf of all of us, a small token and ask you to open it at this time. <laughs> oh, look at this. I've got my own Phi Kappa Phi <laughs> Dr. Gee is a member of Phi Kappa Phi, and he was one of our great minds featured a few years ago.